want you to have your Bible open to the Gospel according to Luke, the 13th chapter. And uh, I want to pick a couple of things up. When I was preparing for the ministry, I believe that a call to serve God was also a call to prepare. Now, you don't have as much trouble with that in your generation, but in the generation in which I came up, um, people believed, many people believed, that that was unnecessary. And it's hard to imagine that, but it was true. So, you're dealing with yourself and your own walk with God in this matter. First, you have to settle whether or not God wants you in the ministry. Years ago, someone said vocationally in the ministry. And uh, I remember the first time I heard that as a vocational minister. And I, I thought, well, what do they mean? Well, they meant that this is what you do and all you do, and this is how you're supported through the ministry and the work of the ministry and that type of thing. I agreed. I had no other desire once the Lord put this desire in my heart. It crowded out every other desire. I had no other desire but to serve the Lord. I remember being in a seminary. I had planned when I finished college at the University of Tennessee. I graduated from a junior college and finished the work there in the junior college. Never went through the graduation exercise. And um, Hawassa College, which was a little Methodist school, and then went on to the University of Tennessee to finish the undergraduate degree. And the plan was all along to go to Southwestern Seminary, which was the largest seminary in the world, it still is. But then the Lord changed my direction. And I believe that convictions made that turn. It was my feeling that, that belief really that They left me. I didn't leave them. And I began to deal with the subject of denominationalism and not to discredit all the good or any good that they've ever done. And there were providential things happening all along with me in that. For instance, when I student taught... um, a student taught with a lady whose husband taught at Furman University. And Furman University was, a, at the time, a Southern Baptist school. As a matter of fact, one of their greatest. But he was an atheist. And he was teaching in the science department as an atheist. And South Carolinians and Southern Baptists were paying his salary in the name of academics. They had to have a man qualified to fill that position. And so he met the qualifications, and I'm sure they thought in the classroom, they thought in the classroom he did an outstanding job, but he was anti-God. And and I thought to myself as a very young man, uh, there are well-meaning people in denominational churches who are contributing every week, especially in South Carolina, as they contribute to these schools, and maybe, maybe they don't know or maybe they don't care. I don't know, but it didn't seem to fit with a man in a, in a Christian college. And someone would say, again, in the name of academics, let's don't discredit everything Furman University has done and the long history they've had and the distinguished graduates that they have just because one man is teaching in a science department who doesn't believe in God. I I can deal with that, but I can't deal with the fact that uh, a so-called inerrancy-believing church is helping pay a salary. That's the problem. Not that he's there. I didn't like the idea that anyone believed that. I didn't agree with it. But there was a disconnect, as far as I was concerned, when a portion of the money that your people give in their tithes and offerings goes somewhere to support someone who is exactly the opposite of what you say you believe in practice. 
But that's the all-encompassing idea of denominationalism. So, you know, I was a young pastor, second church I was pastoring, dealing with that. And my preparation today would have been different um, because there are schools like this school. And there were some schools, I imagine then, but they were basically... um, still sort of a hangover for people who'd never finished high school who went off to a Bible college or Bible school. There was one in Clear Creek, Kentucky that had a very good reputation. Then W.A. Criswell started a school. He really started a school in reaction to all the liberalism that was in. And do you know what liberalism is? You know, back in my day, of your age, we had... Or learn all the terms. What was an evangelical? What was a new evangelical? What was a modernist? What was a liberal? What was a conservative? And uh, Dr. Criswell started a Bible college, and they all signed documents concerning inerrancy of the Scripture. The whole translation had not become an issue. Maybe it should have been. Maybe it shouldn't have been. There was a pastor at Wealthy Street church in in, uh, Michigan, uh, David Otis Fuller, who really wrote a book to try to sort of help bring that to the forefront. And he was a strong G-A-R-B man. The G-R-B. And maybe Dr. Samworth will take the time sometime with you and talk about this, but he was a G-R-B. Really, that was a, a, a meeting that sort of spun off of the Northern Baptist Convention and these were all fighters for the truth, you know. There's a cycle that, that people go through, and it's a purging cycle. Um, and you have people going off in each direction. There are people going off in a more liberal direction, a more moderate direction, <clears throat> and then you have people going off in a more fundamental direction, if there is degrees of this fundamentalism. I don't think there is as far as the theological part of it, but there certainly is in the way people practice it. But there I was faced with a decision about identifying myself with whom, you know. And that's when I came to the real conviction that Christ is the only head of the church. Denominationalism has a tendency to take the place of Jesus Christ as the head. I, I've always had, um, I guess, personality where I wanted to accept as many people as possible. That was very important to me. Very important. So I battled, you know, that. And so I had to make a decision. In matters of theology, there was no room for moving. You know, as far as kindness and benevolence and um, acceptance of people, finding where they are and that type of thing, I I want to be the most tolerant person alive in that. I have friends today who are homosexual, and um, they know I don't agree, and I believe that God's going to deal with them in a big way because the ones I know uh, were professing Christians, and I believe God will will deal with that severely in His chastening work. So there's always been room for the love part of it. But when it comes to matters of theology, you either decide you're standing with God in His Word and do it in the Spirit of Christ, or you're not. So I disassociated myself with an entire movement, the only movement I'd ever known. And my wife, the only movement she'd ever known, and became an independent Baptist and uh, by conviction. And that was personality affected. I don't say driven, but personality affected because you began to admire certain people what they do. And there were effective men, men like Dr. Lee Robertson, who had influenced my life as a child, Men like uh, Jerry Falwell, who was, I thought at the time, really doing a a great job reaching his city for Christ. 
I think the leaven of Herod got into that with the moral majority, and that's for another discussion unless you want to ask a question about it. Uh, Dr. Fall was a clean living man, a very visionary man. I was not one of his strong critics. I'm friends with people who were, but I was not. And uh, went to meetings to hear him and could have been greatly influenced by him. And I always felt like that he was a man with whom you could get close and personal. But then again, what about the matter of separating yourself to the Lord and how does that divide you? And I wound up, you know, working through all of that as an individual. And became affiliated with what I call independent Baptists who are strong, strong promoters of inerrancy of Scripture, the premillennial return of the Lord, the autonomy of the local church. There are several things that you could put on that list. And Baptist by conviction. And so there are, there are people who have gone beyond the Bible in that, and there are people who have gone fallen way short of the Bible. So I'm dealing with your situation now. I'm trying to influence you. I want you to open your Bible to um, Luke. <coughs> if you have it open there, chapter 13. I want to show you something. And this, this has always been to me, the most difficult thing in my own personal life and in trying to, to motivate people, other people. Uh, look with me, please, at the 34th verse. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Note, he says, and ye would not. And then in the 19th chapter of Luke, if you'll turn there, please, the Bible says in verses 41 and following, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes, for the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation, the time when God was moving, when God was visiting. Now, here is always the issue. How, how do we give application to the sermon? How do we give mobilization to the vision? How is it that we, that we do something and make sure it's the right thing to do? From time to time, the people who work here discuss with me the people they think who have it, who have it, and the people who do not have it. Interesting list. The only thing unusual about that list is it changes. And the thing that is most obvious is the passion that someone has or has not. Passion or lack of it. You're going, you're going to, you're going to be frustrated in life about your own motivation, and then especially about how to motivate other people to do what you believe should be done. Where is, um, where is the disconnect there? Where is it? I want to read something to you. I'm not really crazy about Andy Andrews. I, I liked his little book on the butterfly. Anybody familiar with him? Andy Andrews, he's certainly not a theologian. He's just a popular writer. But he's written this 
a little book about about uh, actually the lack of truth and who who can do something about it and why things happen. How do you kill 11 million people? Obviously, most of us have never considered such a thing. Yet when I began to closely research our world's recent history, the last 100 years, that particular question made its unsettling way into my mind. How do you kill 11 million people? 11 million. The number is so large when the word people is attached to it that it becomes almost impossible to take seriously. Why 11 million? You might ask, what's the significance of that number? Is it true that there's no singular significance in that number? Well, yes and no. The actual number is 11,283,000. The number of people recorded who were killed by Adolf Hitler between the years 1933 and 1945. Incidentally, that particular figure only represents institutionalized killings. It does not include 5,200,000 German civilians and military war dead. Neither does it include 28,736,000 Europeans killed during World War II as a result of Hitler's aggressive governmental policies. Within the same parameters, we could have used the number of Cambodians put to death by their own government, slightly more than 3 million between the years 1975 and 1979. 3 million from a total population of 8 million. We could have used the exact figures of 61,911,000. That's the number of people who were murdered by the government of the Soviet Union, shown by their own records between the years 1917 and 1987. But only 54,767,000 of the men, women, and children put to death by the Communist Party were official Soviet citizens. That is 14,322 human lives for every word in this little book I've written. During World War I, the highest leadership council of Turkey, the Young Turks government decided to exterminate every Armenian in the country, whether a soldier already had on the front lines fighting for the government or an expectant mother. If Armenian, they would be killed. This government institutionally killed their own famous scholars their own religious leaders, their own children, and ardent patriots of their own country. All two million of them. We could have used that number instead. But we ask, how did someone kill 11 million? In fact, during our world's last 100 years, there are as many different figures from which to choose. Three million in North Korea, more than a million in Mexico, Pakistan, and the Baltic states. So, the choices are available, and numbers of dead killed at the hands of their own governments are staggering. And in other places around the world, they're just getting started with their killings. For our purpose, let's focus on the number that is probably the most well-known to us, the 11 million human beings exterminated by the Nazi regime. There are many lessons we have learned from that tragic period in history, but one particular part of the story remains quietly hidden from even the most brilliant of scholars. It is the answer to one simple question. How do you kill 11 million people? <clears throat> Only a clear understanding of the answer to this question and the awareness as an involved populace can prevent history from continuing to repeat itself as it already has time and time again. To be absolutely clear, the method a government employs in order to do the actual killing is not in question. We already know the variety of tools used to accomplish mass murder. Neither do we need to consider the mindset of those deranged enough to conceive and carry out the slaughter of innocents. History has provided ample documentation of the 
damage done to societies by this so these psychopaths and social misfits. Why we need to understand is this. 11 million people have lost their lives. How were they killed? Obviously, there's an oversimplification, but this may sound to you oversimplified, but bear with me. If a single terrorist begins with an automatic weapon in a movie theater containing 300 people to start killing, the lone gunman couldn't possibly kill all 300. Why? Because when the shooting started, most of the crowd would run or hide or fight. So why, for month after month and year after year, did millions of intelligent human beings guarded by a relatively few Nazi soldiers willingly load their families into tens of thousands of cattle cars to be transported by rail to one of the many death camps scattered across Europe. How can a condemned group of people headed for a gas chamber be compelled to act in such a docile manner? The answer is breathtakingly simple, and it is a method still being used by some elected leaders to achieve their various goals today. How do you kill 11 million people? It's simple. You lie to them. According to testimony provided under oath by the witnesses of the Nuremberg trials, including specific declarations made in court January 3, 1946, by former SS officers, the act of transporting the Jews to death camps posed a particular challenge for the man who has been named operational manager of the Nazi genocide, Adolf Eichmann, known as the Master. He was directed by written orders on December 1941 to implement the final solution. Eichmann went about the task as if he were president of a multinational corporation. He set ambitious goals, recruited enthusiastic staff, monitored the progress. He charted <coughs> what worked and what didn't work and changed policy accordingly. Eichmann measured achievement in quotas filled. Success was rewarded. Failure was punished. As an intricate web of lies to be delivered in stages was designed to ensure the cooperation of the condemned but unknowing Jews. Jews. First, as barbed wire fences were erected encircling entire neighborhoods, Eichmann and his representatives met with Jewish leaders to assure them that the physical restrictions being placed upon their community in what later became known as ghettos were only temporary necessities of war. As long as they cooperated, he told them, no harm would come <clears throat> to those who stay inside the fence. Second, <clears throat> bribes were taken from the Jews in the promise of better living conditions. The bribes convinced the Jews that the situation was indeed temporary and that no further harm would befall them. After all, they reasoned. Why would the Nazis accept bribes if they only intend to kill us and take away everything? These first two stages of deception were conducted to prevent uprisings or even escapes or attempted escapes. Finally, Eichmann would appear before gatherings in neighborhoods in these ghettos. He would be accompanied by an entourage of no more than 30 local men and officials of his own, unarmed. He addressed the crowd in a strong, clear voice. According to a sworn statement, these were most likely his exact words. And I quote, Jews, at last it can be reported to you that the Russians are advancing on our eastern front. I apologize for the hasty way we brought you into our protection. Unfortunately, there was little time to explain. You have nothing to worry about. We want only the best of you and the best for you. 
you will leave here shortly and be sent to a very fine place. You will work there. Your wives will stay at home and your children will go to school. You will have a wonderful life. We will all be terribly crowded on the trains we have to use to take the journey, but the journey is short. Please keep your families together. Men, work hard and board the rail cars in an orderly manner. Quickly now, my friends, we must hurry. The Germans are moving toward us, or the Russians, rather. The Jewish husbands and fathers were relieved by the explanation and comforted by the fact that there weren't more armed soldiers. They helped their families into the rail cars. The containers designed to transport eight cows in each container were packed with a minimum of 100 human beings and quickly padlocked as soon as they got on board. At that moment, they were lost. The trains rarely stopped until they were well inside the gates of Auschwitz or one of 1,100 other concentration camps. The Jewish Virtual Library says, it is estimated that the Nazis established 15,000 camps in occupied countries they had taken. And that's how you kill 11 million people. You lie to them. But wait, this didn't happen overnight. How did things get so out of hand? How did it get to this point? Well, he goes on to explain, the National Socialist German Workers Party, led by Adolf Hitler, rose to power during a time of economic uncertainty in a nation of people longing for a better life. Germany was a modern, industrialized nation whose well-informed citizens enjoyed ready access to information by way of print and radio broadcast and other means of media. Hitler was a man of the common people. Not long before he had been a lance corporal in the army, and his speeches were exciting and passionate. He promised more and better and new and different. He vowed rapid change and swift action. According to the record, what Hitler actually said in his speeches depended very much upon the audience. In agricultural areas, he pledged tax cuts for farmers and new laws to protect food prices. In working class neighborhoods, he talked about redistribution of wealth and attacked the high profits generated by rich business owners. When he appeared before financial officers and captains of industries, Hitler focused on his plan to destroy communism and reduce the power of the trade unions. How fortunate for leaders, Hitler said to his inner circle, that men do not think. Make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, eventually they'll believe it. In Mein Kampf, Hitler's autobiography, he wrote, the great masses of the people will more easily fall victim to a big lie than a small one. The book was widely read by German people at that time. The masses believed him. Or at the very most, they ignored him. It's a fact that fewer than 10% of Germany's population, 79.7% or a million people, actively worked, campaigned, or gave any effort to bring about Hitler's change. Meaning a little more than 20% carried it all out. Even at the height of its power in 1945, the Nazi political party boasted only 8.5 million members. The remaining 90% of Germans, teachers, doctors, ministers, and farmers, did nothing but stand by and watch. Mothers and fathers held their voices, covered their eyes, closed their ears. The vast majority of educated population accepted their salaries and avoided the uncomfortable, uncomfortable truth that lingered over them like a serpent waiting to strike. And when the Nazis came for their children, it was too late. 
Now, it goes on to explain that 100 million American citizens, 100 million American citizens who have a voting privilege in America do not vote, do not vote in national elections. And that in no national election in the last 25 years has more than 10 million votes decided the winner. In the last election, the winner was decided by 3 million votes in the popular vote while 100 million Americans do not vote. Who can vote? How do you kill 11 million people? Let me ask you this. There are 311 million people in America. How do you destroy a nation? You lie to them, and the overwhelming masses of the society just sit idly by and do nothing. I'm saying to you, the great issue is in motivating people to action. That's the great issue. Now, let's, let's throw out a few things, okay? How do we motivate people to action? I think the tendency is to be reactionary, reactionary. The mistake is made when we're not proactive. My life should not be reduced to an echo. John the Baptist said he's what? A what? Voice. A voice. Most of us never move or do anything until we have to react to something we, that brings some measure of displeasure. Now, I think they're attempting to cool the place <coughs> of all of it coming in this room. And um, I, I want to ask you a question. There must be Clarity. Clarity. A clearly defined purpose, agenda, plan of action, whatever. But there must be clarity. There must be urgency. Do we have urgency? Yes. Yes. There must be leadership. Think of it. How, how does this happen? A handful of people destroy the lives of millions of people? How does this happen? Stalin supposedly had a chicken brought into his presence, and Stalin either had plucked or plucked all the feathers out of a living chicken. And the chicken was nearly dead, of course, from, from the torture of that. And then he took food for the chicken and held it out, and the chicken ate out of his hand. And he said, this is how we control the masses. Meaning starve them, abuse them, and then provide the only answer to what they want. Just like this chicken, they'll keep coming to us. And you know, here we are in a room like this trying to talk to people about training for the Lord's work. And most of you plan to just go out and, and do whatever is just there to do. How do you make a difference? How is it you make a difference? And you add to that list. 
Clarity, urgency, leadership. Look at our own country. We have a government that has purchased a majority party with entitlements. And a population of people who are more concerned about what they get than they are about who is over them while we, while we have no voice in this matter, it seems. And we are gripped by feelings of um, not just indifference, but inability that leads to indifference. What can be done? Now, here I am trying to motivate a group of Bible-believing people. We say things like, you know, we're going to have a Baptist friends meeting, and we've all come to the Lord as our personal Savior. We've identified with a local assembly of believers that identifies Baptist, independent Baptist people who are free from all entanglements of denominationalism. So we've got nobody to blame in the denomination for our problems. We have, we have the ability and access to find where people are and where need is and find unreached people groups and everything imaginable. We, we, we state our case by saying we're founded on biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity. That's where we are. We define it simply as biblical Christianity. And we talk about how we, how we approach Scripture. Very important. I remember one time in church I passed in Patterson, New Jersey, we had to go through a conversion. Every church has to go through a conversion. You know? It's like a human being. That human being has to be converted to Christ. You say, well, a church, no, don't, don't, don't expect that. Look, the world moves on its own will. People move on their will. We have to die to self to do God's will. So I came there with these ideas I thought were biblical, believed they were biblical, and the men in the church had a meeting. We were accustomed to doing this thing this way. Two things they told me when I came there. Now, look, you're in the Northeast. You're 11 miles from New York City. You're in one of the most populated areas in the world. And we've been here for nearly 100 years, and, and we have a way of doing things. Number one, we don't believe the minister should raise his voice in the pulpit. Number two, we don't believe in public invitations. Now, they did not define that as a form of hyper-Calvinism, but... And I believe that Jesus Christ tasted death for every man and the free offer of the gospel will be made to everybody. They knew that when they called me. Was the church really that way? No. The church was led by people who would lead. They'd been without a pastor for five years and so there were prominent lay people and women, men and women, who rose to positions of leadership and it was their way. That had to be changed. I didn't want to run the church. I wanted to lead the church the way the Lord wanted us to ha have it. So I couldn't do that by myself. I had to say to a group of people, let's all follow the Lord. So I wasn't there long till they called a meeting. It's always interesting when they call the meetings, you know. They called the meeting and said, we, we want to have a talk with you. And they were meeting in a room, downstairs in the room, and they circled the wall. Now, interesting, they were, they, were, they were in a room, and they could have all gathered in one place, but they circled the room so that when I came in, I had to be in the middle of it. Everywhere I looked, people were around me. It's like the Indians coming around the wagon train. And I couldn't have planned this. I didn't know that the meeting was going to be conducted. We want to see you. And I went into the room, and they began to state their cases. I listened. This was the moment God chose. I could never have gotten that whole crowd together that way. Good men, oh, I think well-meaning men, you have to discern at times whether people really truly believe they're right or they're just trying to be antagonistic and mean and hateful. 
Well, these were people who, who really believed they were right. So God led me to take my Bible in my hand. I took my Bible in my hand, and I, I put it down on the floor, right in the middle of them. And I got down on my knees on top of the Bible. God put in my mind to give that visual appearance. I'm sure it never left their minds. And I said, I want to promise you something. I am going to teach and preach the Bible, rely on the Bible. The sole authority for our faith and practice is the Word of God. This is where I'm going to stand. This is where I've always tried to stand, and God helping me where I always will stand. And I want to do that in the right spirit. Now, gentlemen, that's what I came here to do. And I prayed with them while I was there on my knees. And they started leaving the room. But one word was spoken. And they started leaving the room. And finally, I was left in the room by myself. And the meeting was over. And that was the end of that. It was the end of it. That church had elders and deacons. And the elders were the spiritual people. The deacons were the business people. And the deacons would not tell the elders anything about the business of the church. And the elders didn't tell the deacons anything about the spiritual part of the church. And uh, I don't know how they got that divide, but they had it, and it was really ingrained. I didn't want to operate that way. And that was an elder-run church. Baptist church, but an elder-run church. And the pastor had to gain power. Now, that's not what you think it is. I had authority. They called me as their pastor. I had the pulpit. I could get up and speak. They really wanted to introduce me every time, but that was unnecessary after a while. They all knew who I was, you know. But that was, it wasn't introducing me. It was controlling the thing and just, I'm the hired speaker, you know. And so, one by one, those men learned that the church could be pastor-led. But the pastor had to gain power. Even though he had authority, he had to gain power by burying the dead, marrying the young, praying with the sick, gaining their hearts. It took time. It took time, but it was worth the time it took. The church had to be motivated to move forward. It was a dying church in a dying place, a dying city. Um, with every kind of variable imaginable in the equation of trying to have church. No parking, multicultural, crime, constant graffiti. We were, we were one block from um, Eastside High School. That's the high school they did the movie on with Joe Clark and the baseball bat and the bullhorn. He came to our church occasionally. He had to kick out 600 kids the first year he was there. Many of them were 23, 24, 25 year old. They were there selling drugs. Then they fired him, by the way, after President Reagan gave him the award for being the number one educator in America. People are fickle. Never forget that. They're fickle. What have you done for me lately? You know? So, yeah, and, or today or most recently. But anyway... I love those people and they learned to love me. I had to love them before they would love me. You can't go anywhere expecting people to love you. Love is a return thing. We love Jesus because he first loved us, right? The Lord Jesus. And you're there and you love them. And they'll love you. Don't demand their love. That's ridiculous. It's like saying to a woman married to you, you've got to love me. No, no, no. You love her. She'll love you. She answers to you. She'll love you. I'm trying to help you with this thing of motivating people. See, the tragedy is, the tragedy is that after a while, after a while, 
when you can't get them motivated, you cease to be motivated. And you join their ranks. They don't join your ranks. You join their ranks. And you must know very clearly what God's given you to do and be able to articulate it with clarity. There must always be a sense of urgency. There is. Life brings urgency. What's happening in our world brings urgency. And it must have leadership. Not just from you, but people who come alongside you, that you bring alongside and train, and they lead. And then, of course, as Moody said, my human best, those three things, filled with God's Spirit. The Lord must anoint it, quicken it, raise it from the dead. But this isn't a sermon, or is it? You see, we have enough Bible colleges, seminaries, to change the world. We have enough churches. There are 2,000 plus mosques in America. Seven million people who practice Islam in America. They get more done with their crowd for their cause than we get more done more, get done with our crowd for our cause. Why? What's the issue? Just like in the voting process, why do a hundred million people never go cast a vote? Why? Why do? 80% of a population, why does 80% of a population sit by while 20% of Germany changed the nation and put to death 11 million people? You answer that question. Answer it and you'll, you'll get something done. You've got to answer it. I'm trying to motivate you. Now, you've got the preparation when you get the studies and get all the things in your heart and mind. Some of you, some of you don't talk about anything. You think, well, I'm incapable of articulating what I believe. No, 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 no. You need, you need urgency and you need necessity. And you talk. You talk. It's in there. You need to work at it. Nobody gave you a pass and said, you don't have to. You may have tried to give yourself one, but I guarantee you God didn't give you one. No wonder Jesus with a broken heart, the Lord Jesus with a broken heart said, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, it would send forth laborers in this harvest. Um, so he's weeping over Jerusalem and he said, you had your time and ye would not. Not could not. Ye would 